Welcome back, folks, to the Sick Podcast Recruits Draftcast. Guys, today's a big one. We got the Bob Father. We got Bobby Margarita on deck. Bob McKenzie is going to join us to talk about his midterm rankings. It's never too early to talk about prospects, and that's that's exactly what we're going to do today. Uh, we got lots to, to dive into, so let's get into it. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to the Sick Podcast. Sick Podcast. Recruits Draft Cast. And with the first overall selection in the 2023 NHL Draft, the Chicago Blackhawks are very proud to select from the Regina Pats, the Western Hockey League, Connor Bedard. The sickest NHL Draft and Scouting Podcast. It's gonna be sick. As always, I'm your host, producer Shane, the man by my side. You know him, you love him, with his dog this time around. Grant, how we doing? <laughs> yeah, we just got back from a big vet appointment yesterday, and he's uh, he's looking for some attention, so I think we better give it to him. This is Teddy. Fair enough. Everyone, say hi to Teddy. He's our mascot. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, yeah. he'll be part of the show uh, more, more times uh, in the future. But um, Grant, pretty big guest coming on here. Uh, pretty excited <laughs> yeah oh yeah well so am i so am i so let's let's just bring him in uh the legend himself mr bob mckenzie bob thanks for taking the time to chat with us how you doing excellent guys how you doing today i'm doing fa- i'm doing fantastic uh you know yesterday I, I always look forward to your rankings and i was not disappointed it's it's an exciting draft coming up and we're going to talk all about it uh but there are some things we'd like to get to before that particular this year's draft uh it's it's bittersweet because it is the last centralized draft meaning that all the teams and their scouting staff will be present at the at the venue moving forward starting next year that won't be the case anymore now grant and i have talked about this on the show previously we (laughs) you know we weren't too thrilled about this this new um decision but what, what were your thoughts on it how do you how do you see this whole thing going down yeah, I guess, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in some respects, I guess maybe I thought it was going to be inevitable that it would eventually get to this because of cost or logistics or all those things. But the thing that I always loved about the National Hockey League draft uh, was that it was the sort of the official end of season party. It was a mm-hmm. convention. It was the entire hockey world, um, NHL, the junior hockey people, whatever, everybody would gather usually in Montreal, and um, it's this massive convention with a great amount of buzz that goes with it because it's not just the draft. It's also the week before. Generally speaking, it's always been the week before free agency. Mm -hmm. So there's usually lots of trades and free agent talk, and it's just this, it's like Woodstock, the first Woodstock for hockey fans. (laughs) And and now you're going to have all the teams stay in their own cities, and, and I'm sure from a logistics point of view, from a convenience point of view, there's probably a lot of teams that are really happy to do it. And Mm -hmm. from the cost point of view, the NHL. Um, But it just, you know, the the thing that made hockey unique was that they were the last ones to do this convention style um, draft. And uh, now we're just going to go the way of the NFL, the NBA and and whatever else. So it's, it's really unfortunate. And you know, it's kind of exciting that the draft is in Vegas, although I don't go to the draft now anymore because we don't broadcast it, so I have no reason to be there. But mm-hmm. and it's going to be at the Sphere. And I, so I, I, at first when I thought that, I was like, oh, this is really cool. And then I started thinking about the Sphere. Well, what is the Sphere? The Sphere is this massive multimedia new age thing where once you're in there, it's like suspending disbelief. And yeah. I mean, it's, it's great for a U2 show. I just worry that it might be this dizzying cacophony of video and music and sound and and so much so that when the draft's actually going on and teams are trying to figure out what the heck's going on, there's going to be whatever it is, a hundred foot sphere wall behind them, you know, belting out whatever. And and so I there, there was part of me thought, yeah, it's the last one. We try to go to Vegas for the last one. And then I thought, nah, what the hell? I don't need another trip to Vegas. And I... I, it's, I, it, Montreal was the, uh, the the place where the draft was the best. Whenever it was in Montreal, that was the best. And I realize I'm sounding like an old guy now, but uh, let's get off my <laughs> lawn. 
but uh, Montreal is the, the, the home of the draft. It was the birthplace of the draft. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really miss those days at the Montreal Forum. Well, just, just the 2022 draft, you know, I got the, the, the privilege to be there in attendance and it was insane. I mean, it's just such a memorable experience. Obviously it was, it was an eventful draft. A lot of, a lot of stuff happening, right. That the first overall, you didn't know who was going to be and all of this, but I, I agree with you that that draft was special. Now well, the, the what, spirit... what you're going to lose, see what you lose is the potential for drama. So just That's as it. an example, mm-hmm. I was in the Montreal forum that the Montreal Canadiens trotted out Peter Sloboda oh. and nobody knew he was there and nobody knew they were taking him and the place went bonkers. It was bananas. Yeah. It was electric and, yeah. and that sort of stuff. And, uh, Defected. And, you know, and, and, and another one, um, you know, the, people always ask me for draft memories and one of my most bizarre draft memories, but I always remember this was the time that the Philadelphia Flyers drafted <laughs> a kid named Barry Tababadong in the third or fourth or fifth round. Um, and, uh, he, he was a tough guy that played for Bill LaForge's Oshawa generals back in the day. And yeah. Barry was so excited at being drafted that he jumped up at the forum and he wanted to get into the next row in front of him. So he stepped on the seat in front of him. And if you know, the seats at the old forum, they levered up like that. He stepped on the back end of the seat and his foot went jammed <laughs> right through and he couldn't get it out and so they had to get a maintenance man up there to take the seat apart so he could go down and get his jersey from the his sweater from the philadelphia flyers and uh, yeah. the, the sad postscript to that is that uh, uh barry was killed in a tragic snow plow he was a snow plow driver uh, up in uh, perry island and near the reserve there in perry sound and um oh. yeah, and he uh, it was really unfortunate but uh, that's always one of my great crazy draft memories and and when you have a centralized location and the NHL headquarters will be there with all the draft prospects, but the teams are everywhere else, it's just going to lose a lot. It's not going to be the same. Yeah, I know. I, I completely agree. And I mean, you mentioned them following the formula of, of the NFL, the NBA. One thing that, that does concern me with that is you know, whether or not they're going to have at least one representative from each team, you'd have to think so because you can't have Gary up there the whole night getting booed. Uh, that would just ruin everything. And I imagine well, you're, you're one of the players <laughs> waiting to need to hear your name called and all you hear is booing. And then, Oh, did he, did he call me? Like, so I, I you have to think they're going to have at least one representative from each team. Yeah, I don't know. I, it, I know right? nothing about the logistics. I'm the hockey outsider now, not the hockey yeah. insider. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know any of that stuff, and I just know that it makes me sad to think that uh, the great convention, hockey convention, that signified the basically the end of the hockey year, yeah. where everybody was there, and you get to see all the reporters and all the media and all the broadcasters and all the teams and the scouts and the managers and the coaches, and virtually everybody was there in hockey. It was just a great festival. I agree. No, it's a, it's it was an event. It's it's still going to be this year. Um, I'm curious to see how it's going to go down in the sphere. That's, yeah, that's going to be something else. Uh, right. But Grant, Grant, I know you were excited to talk to Bob about his time with with the hockey news and and take a trip down memory lane. So I'll I'll leave the floor well, to you. I I'm going to uh, just expand a little bit on this uh, first topic here. Um, yeah. Have you talked to any scouts that like the idea, Bob? I know everyone that I've talked to wishes that it had stayed the same. Yeah, to be honest with you, when I when I surveyed the scouts, I haven't asked anybody about that. Um, oh, okay. So short answer is I don't know. Okay, okay. I just, I, I you know, uh, scouts would bring their families. Uh, you know, uh, like Trevor's uh, young lad used to get up on stage all the time with the draft pick, and, it, you know, he You'd see the different year every year, you know, getting a little older. Well, uh, we, we we saw Daryl Cates' family grow up before our very eyes. Yeah, you know, and uh, yeah, there's a good example, you know. Um, and uh, I, and I mean, the kids that, that that go to the draft from each, you know, you'd have it in a different town. I mean, I agree with it. Like it was great in Montreal, but uh, one of the night the positive things about it being in different cities is, you know, if you're, you're a fan of the game and you got to take your kids and go and watch your, your, you know, the guy get picked in the first round. Like, I mean, Montreal was the ultimate example in 2022 with them having the first pick, which was a rarity, but 
I mean, uh, that's, you know, that we're not going to have that anymore either. You know? No, you lose, a, you lose a lot. And you're right. I mean, it was, I mean, I think it was in Jersey that time and uh, Batman was up there and he says, you've got a trade and they were all booed. Him and he says, you're going to want to hear this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember it was the Corey Schneider uh, going to Jersey trade. Yeah. yeah. Did, were you, uh, were you at the Mario draft? Oh, or? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that was, you know, and again, the, the drama of Mario Lemieux being at the draft, he, he announced he's drafted by Pittsburgh and he just kind of sits in the seat. And, he's kind of <laughs> yeah. like, and he, had the, he had this great Gallic shrug, like as if to say, like, mm, fine, you may have <laughs> drafted me, but I'm not acting excited about it. And, and I always remember he had a great suit on that day. Um, and... Uh, I think it was black with a very thin silver pinstripe and uh and he ended up going to the table and uh he he took the jersey but he wouldn't put it on yeah and uh and and, and that was that was a dramatic moment that was wow. that was really really something special and uh, especially in montreal with you know Montreal yeah. loves its uh, local heroes and, and not many bigger than Mario, so that was that was a fun one too. Well, at least Eric didn't go that far. He, you know, you knew that he probably wasn't going to Quebec, but he, you know, yeah. he didn't just sit in a seat, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I just uh, want to take a bit of a trip down memory lane here and uh, just talk about you know growing up and how you, uh, well, how you became became the draft guru really you know i mean you're you're my mentor when it comes to the nhl and the draft and uh i'll, I'll touch on that in a few minutes but um i mean you grew up uh you know uh in scarborough i'm gonna say the 1900s we'll say <laughs> um <laughs> robert malcolmson mckenzie That's now correct. Got a little bit of Scottish heritage there. I well, it's mostly Irish. Um, oh, okay. But I'm sure there's probably a lot of crossover <laughs> there. Um, the, uh, the the middle name Malcolmson's kind of uh, interesting. That's my um, my grandmother's maiden name, her family name. Okay. And um, and she uh, so that yeah that's sad. If you've if you've ever seen um, Ray Donovan, um, yes. Ray Donovan's wife. Her name is Paula Malcolmson, and uh, that's because her grandfather and my grandmother um, were uh, were brother and sister. So I don't know her at all. I've never met her, but uh, we, we we share part of the same name. And she's in Deadwood and uh, Sons of Anarchy and a lot of different shows like that. So <laughs> okay. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. But, it, but anyway, I digress. Um, yeah, so I, I grew up in Scarborough and, um, you know, loved to play hockey. Wasn't any good at it, but I still loved to play it. I uh, loved to follow it. I uh, loved to, uh, you know, I can very well remember the Toronto Maple Leafs winning the Stanley Cup in 1967. But what I really remember about that was I, I kept a scrapbook of all the articles from the Toronto Star, the Toronto Telegram and the Globe and Mail. And, and when the playoffs were over, I had this huge scrapbook with all the uh, – all the articles of Red Burnett and Frank Orr and Milt Dunnell and Jim Proudfoot and uh, Rex McLeod and on and on it goes. So, um, so yeah, that was kind of my uh, environment growing up and uh, never really set out to, uh, you know, I was like every kid, I guess I wanted to play in the NHL, but I think a lot of people say, well, when they got to be 16 or 17, they realized they're never going to play in the NHL. I never thought I was good enough to play in the NHL. <laughs> yeah. so, and so that was never a consideration. But um, I guess after I graduated high school, I started to think that I might want to do something with the written word because I was terrible at math, terrible at science. So I, um, I, I ultimately decided to go into journalism. That, that's cool. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I tell the story that I got called up uh, in, my, in my second midget year to uh, play against the Nepean Raiders when Steve Eisenman was with them. And he was 15, I was 17, and he skated circles around me. And I said, okay, uh, college, it's college for you there, young lad. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm the same as you. I took journalism. Uh, actually, I started with broadcasting. 
tried that at Algonquin and, and uh, you know, as you can tell by how, uh, you know, <laughs> how unsmooth I am here, <laughs> I made the right decision to, uh, to um, move into um, journalism. But, uh, you know, I was hoping to be the next Daddy Gallivan, but I, I soon realized that that wasn't going to be the case. And just I, was like the you. I, I was the opposite. I never had any interest. In, I never even thought about broadcasting. I never expected to be on television or radio or anything. I just wanted to be a hockey writer. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, it, I never actually became a beat writer and kind of skipped those steps um, and uh, <laughs> what have you. But, um, you know, I ended up being a columnist of the Toronto Star and editor in chief of the Hockey News and all of those things. But, um, I never, uh, never set out to uh, be quote unquote an insider, or and I never anticipated that, you know, it was just sort of an or organic thing. I always covering junior hockey. My first job was at the Sioux Star in Sioux Saint Marie, um, so I covered junior hockey. I spent a lot of time in junior rinks. When you spend time in junior rinks, you're around scouts. They're there to scout the prospects. You get to know the scouts, and you know that aspect of the uh, the game kind of intrigued me a lot and there were, there's two levels to it in junior hockey so in junior hockey they have a draft of you know 15 or 16 year olds to stock the league so I covered and was interested in, in that so you'd follow what was going on in minor hockey um, right and and that and at the same time you were at the rink and you got to know the NHL scouts and it was the NHL draft and you would follow uh, and get to that, that. And so I always had a strong affinity for those drafts and who the next kids coming along are and what the next group of next wave of talent is going to look like. I, uh, I don't know about you, but I had a subscription to the hockey news from about the age of 10 on. I just loved it. It was, there, there weren't, you know, not like today when you hockey news, you can get just so much of it. It was, uh, basically your only, uh, link to the junior leagues and uh, um, I I started following the draft probably 1973 because I was a 67s fan and uh, Denny Pot fan went first overall that year and that kind of you know it, that was my introduction really to the draft and I just kind of was a huge draft fan from then on um, did you follow the draft in uh, before you before uh, and and did you have the hockey news before you uh well i i never had a subscription to the hockey okay. news, which is funny even though i became <laughs> the chief um when i was 25 years old yes. but um you know in terms of the draft i i probably and again this happened sort of organically um once i got to junior hockey once i got the job at the sioux star that's when i really started to dial in when I was covering the Sioux Greyhounds, then that's where I started to really dial into the draft. And I also had the, um, at, at the time, I, I started going out with a girl on the, the last day of grade 13 and uh, ultimately became my wife, Cindy. But her, her younger brother, um, John. John Goodwin, he was playing minor hockey at the time for, for Wexford. And in Toronto, in the, in the Metropolitan Toronto Hockey League, now the GTHL. And um, so he wanted to get drafted in the OHL. And once he got to the OHL, he wanted to get drafted to the NHL. And so, again, organically, being part of a family and being around somebody who was going through the process, you become that much more acutely aware of the ups and downs and what's involved in it. And, and so, and, and plus it ended up being my job, both at the Sioux star and then as editor in chief of the hockey news. So, but, but having that connection to John and the ironic thing is he won OHL rookie of the year, beat Don Beaupre out for OHL rookie of the year uh, in the 78, 79 season with the Greyhounds. Um, and he won the OHL scoring championship in his last year. And in, after his second season in the OHL and his third season in the OHL, he never got drafted at all. Right. Um, even though he led the league in scoring. And so <laughs> the, if, if there should have been a family aversion to drafts, we, we probably should have had it. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it, it also taught me a lot about the, the sort of the human side of what it's like to get drafted, to not get drafted, to want to get drafted and, and have a better understanding of, of the process that all these kids go through both beginning to junior hockey and getting to the NHL. 
you've uh, you've answered a lot of my questions as you've gone along here. <laughs> the, uh, um, so, I mean, that's quite a coincidence that I, I thought maybe, you know, I, I'm picturing, well, Cindy must have gone to a game in Sault Ste. Marie and, you know, ran into her there or something. But here, here's the very so you quick both ended up in the Sioux. Yeah, here's the but, very quick version of how it happened. I actually ended up in the Sioux before Johnny did. So, okay. as I said, he was playing for the Wexford uh, Midgets. And they were in what was then called the Wrigley Playdown. And the Wrigley Playdowns was the forerunner of the Air Canada Cup, the forerunner of the TELUS Cup, the National Midget Championship. So they yep. had won the Southern Ontario Playdown for, to, to advance to the next level of the Wrigley Playdowns. And, the, and they had to go on the day after Christmas in uh, 1977, maybe it was the 77, 78 season. Yeah, 70, 77, 78. So Christmas of 77, Boxing Day, I went with the, the, the Wexford team on a bus. Um, Johnny's dad, uh, me, and, and all the other parents that were going and stuff. And we went to Sault Ste. Marie, and that's where the playdowns occurred. So two things happened during those playdowns. The Wexford team won and earned the right to go to Verdun for the uh, for the national champion Wrigley uh, National Midget Championship, yeah. and I got to meet the sports editor of the Sioux Star and some media people in Sault Ste. Marie. So while I was there, I started asking about. I was in my second year of Ryerson's journalism program. I said, huh, um, "What do I got to do to get a summer job at the the Sioux Star?" So they hooked me up with the managing editor. I put an application in. And lo and behold, by February or March of that year, 78, um, towards the end of my second year of, of Ryerson, um, I had a summer job at the Sioux Star. And then it was in April, May, June, somewhere around there that the OHL draft happened. And the Sioux Greyhounds took John, Johnny Goodwin in the fifth round. And so I, I moved up to the Sioux for that summer. And then Johnny came up at the... Uh, at the end of that summer for his first training camp with Paul Coffey and the other guys who got drafted at the same time as he yeah. did. Did you, uh, I was going to ask you about like, did you uh, foresee Coffey becoming the, the superstar? Yeah. That he, yeah, I, yeah pe people ask me one of the, you know, things you'll never forget. <laughs> it wasn't the first time I saw Paul Coffey skate because I would go to Johnny's games in the, in the Metropolitan Toronto Hockey League and, his birth year was like Steve Ludzik and Johnny Kirk and uh, uh, Daryl Evans and uh, Greg Gilbert was a year older, but it was a midget team. So there were uh, when when Johnny was the first year midget, uh, he played for the, uh, the Mississauga reps. And um, so Steve Ludzik, as I said, Johnny Kirk, Daryl Evans, Larry Murphy, um, Paul Coffey. So I saw I would go to the games and see all these guys. But when I w went to the first Sault Ste. Marie training camp, it was at the old, um, it was at the Lake Superior State University college rink because the, uh, I think there were the, the roof had blown off the Memorial Gardens in Sault Ste. Marie. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so I went over there and I saw, first time I really saw coffee at that level was in training camp and he picked up the puck behind the net and he just blew up the ice and it, and people say the, the most impressive skating you've ever seen, he just like it was hovered over the ice. Yeah, and, yeah. and it didn't take very long to realize that he was going to be a big time offensive defenseman in the National Hockey League. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I guess you saw Ronnie Francis as a, as a rookie? Yep, we used to ride the bus with Ronnie. Ronnie was the most conscientious kid on the team. Everybody else would be screwing around on the bus and Ronnie <laughs> was doing his homework. Um, and, and Ronnie was a local kid, obviously. He lived at home and... Got to see his mom and dad and his brother through all the games. And uh, uh, John Van Beesbrook was on that team. Uh, and uh, yeah, so yeah, it was uh, it was it was a lot of fun. The, um, I mean, Johnny Goodwin. I mean, that was a heck of a fifth round pick. He had 166 points in his last year. Yeah. And I was I was going back over it. Uh, Bobby Smith, Gretzky, Dougie Gilmore. And Mike Kazicki, who I'm sure you remember too, yeah. are the only guys that have ever scored more points in the Ontario League. And Johnny never got drafted. Why? Like, yeah. give me your. Well, he was the, the skating, obviously. He was, yeah, he wasn't a great skater, and he wasn't. He wasn't a big. He was. He was six feet tall, just six feet yeah. tall. 
but he was like a hundred when he when he graduated junior he was probably 165 pounds if that and he wasn't the strongest guy right. in the world and he wasn't a, a fast skater and if you remember hockey back then um, <laughs> skating was important but being big and strong or being hockey strong was really uh sure um, even more important because it was a it was a physical game and it mm. was a, a, a chaotic game but um yeah yeah he uh and he still played uh you know i don't know seven eight years of pro um won yeah. a won a turner cup in the uh, the ihl with the peoria rivermen um uh his first year as head coach was john brophy with the nova scotia voyagers <laughs> and Brof Brof ended up liking him so much down the road that when Brof was the head coach in st catherine's st catherine's and and uh and so johnny and Brof got along famously and which is funny because johnny was an offensive player and uh and yeah. junior hockey and he became sort of a checking center but who could chip in offensively and uh bro really liked him so that's funny I, I don't know if he played with rod shoot or not do you remember rod played for sudbury yeah uh, I, yeah I, uh, he was uh he he used to play for um when when johnny played nova scotia i went to a game in erie they just put a team pittsburgh put their farm team in erie and I, if i remember correctly rod Chet was on that team so okay well, he played for the Boisiers too, but uh, he also played under Brophy. I don't know yeah. if they were teammates then or not, but uh, yeah. he tells a story about uh, like he loved Brophy. <laughs> I guess uh, he um, he had a Timex watch and he like he was just storming because they'd lost, and he threw it on the he threw it on the ground and he started stomp he stomped on it, uh, Brophy. <laughs> and uh, so the <laughs> the next day um, he laughed and. Rod uh, swept up the swept up the uh, watch and put it in a bag. And then uh, when they had practice later, he brought it out to him, had it to him, and said, uh, "Takes a lick and keeps on ticking." He said, to, and you know, it was one of the Brophy didn't laugh, but you could tell, you know, he, he knew that he was smiling inside. He said, <laughs> "Very, very quick Brophy story. Similar, he in St. Catharines, he one of the players on the team um, had a nice sports coat and Brof was a very natty dresser. He, he really used to dress up. And uh, so Brof <laughs> saw this guy's sports coat and really liked it. And so he showed up on the bench wearing it um, <laughs> during the game. And the player's like, that's that's my guy. He goes, I really like it. He said, so guys all thought it was really funny. Well, they had a really bad first period and he came in. And he went ballistic in the dressing room. And he took the coat off and ripped it in half. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that doesn't sound like it was a one-time thing then. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh boy, that's crazy. Um, but the hockey news. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I lived in the in the rural area, and you, you know, you had the mailbox, and I just waited. If my hockey news didn't come in on the day it was supposed to come in, I was just, I, I was distraught. I just loved it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, Bill Libby, uh, Bob Verde, Stan Fischler, Jay Greenberg, yeah. all those guys, you know, I remember yeah. reading all their articles and later Al Mag Morganti and, but Ken McKenzie was the publisher, right? Right. And then uh, Ken retires and then along comes this guy I'd never heard of, the young <laughs> lad, then all of a sudden he's like editor in chief. And I go, what the heck happened there? Is this nepotism or what? But it, obviously, Ken's That's not it. related to you. But what's no. the story there? How did you get that well, job? You must well, have been German. I worked at the Sioux Star for the better part of two and a half years. Yeah. And then wanted to come back home to Toronto. So I came back home and I worked freelance for the better part of a year. I worked two or three rewrite shifts a week at the Globe and Mail. I did a little freelance for the Globe and Mail, uh, junior hockey stories. And um, I wrote for a junior hockey magazine. Um, Okay. Uh, that used to exist back in the day and i used to do some freelance for the um the hockey news as well and uh it was during my time of doing tom murray was the editor-in-chief um a guy named don wall was the publisher ken mckenzie had, was no longer involved in the publication he sold it to a company out in new york called the whitney communications corporation yeah and it was wcc publishing and so they were based on king street in toronto so they, I got a note from Tom Murray, a call from Tom Murray partway through that year. And he said, Hey, um, I'm leaving to go back to the States, uh, at the end of this season, um, we're gonna have to hire a new editor in chief. Um, 
would that be something you'd be interested in being considered for? And I'm like, yeah, wow. sure. It sounds great <laughs> to me. I was trying to get, all I wanted to, at that stage of my life, I just wanted to be a hockey writer and I wanted to get a job with the Toronto Star, the Toronto Sun or the Globe and Mail covering the Toronto Maple Leafs and being a beat reporter in the NHL. But I was having no luck getting a full-time job with those papers. And so we, I was like, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested. And so fortunately at the Sioux star, I did a lot of, I did a lot of copy editing. I did a lot of production stuff, laying out pages, writing headlines, writing cut lines, doing yeah. all that sort of stuff. And so when they interviewed me at the hockey news and they realized that I, I had a real, you know, real passion for hockey, obviously a real sort of affinity from the grassroots on up, um, you know, knew the history of the game because I just grew up in that environment. Um, and then on top of that, had the editing and production skills to maybe do the behind the scenes stuff that's so important in putting a newspaper together. And again, I was hopelessly unqualified in terms of business yeah. acumen or anything else. I was, I was 25 years old. Um, yeah. I only had a full-time job at the Sioux Star and nowhere else. Um, and yet I ended up getting the job and that was on June 1st, 1982. One of the first things I did was go to the draft and that was the Gord Kluzak, Gary Nyland. Uh, oh, great. And, uh, was, was that Bellows? Was that that year or was Kluzak I think one so, or two? Yeah. I can't even remember. Bellows one, Kluzak yeah. two. Yep. And that, yeah. So that was the, um, that was the, it wasn't the first draft I went to because when I was at the Sioux Star, I would go to the drafts as well. So, okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, and then I got the job at, at the Hockey News and, and then I just made a point of, um, as time wore on, I, the thing people don't realize now, it's funny, because like, you like the draft grant, every, there's all, there's a certain swath of hockey society that absolutely is, is avid about the draft and prospects. Um, in the 1980s, I can tell you there was no mainstream media coverage mm -hmm. of the draft in any way, shape or form. Yeah. And, and the only time anybody would write about the draft was in the day or two or three before that, the beat writers would write a story about what was the team might do and who the guys were that they might draft. But there was no there was no prospect list at, at, at one point there was, I think the first one that I can remember was Kyle Woodleaf had something called the red line report. And it was, it was his own private service that he went out and scouted players and talked to people. And, and uh, the reason it was the red line report is because it was printed on, I think it was on printed on red paper. So that <laughs> it, it couldn't be, it couldn't be photocopied. Right. Um, and uh, that was how he tried to protect proprietary information. And he sold subscriptions to that and teams would subscribe to it or fans would subscribe to it. But he, he might've been the pioneer on that front. If, if there was somebody else doing it, I don't remember who it was. No. But um, the very first year that I ever did anything special for the draft was 1985. I, I had to, sorry, 1984. 84. So we, were getting we have ready. a picture of it here. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah, were getting ready to. Um, well, that was <laughs> in, that's that's the first draft preview. That's yes. the first draft preview, and that one would have been in '88. But in 1984, with the Mario draft, that was the first year that I ever surveyed NHL mm. scouts to get a consensus ranking. And okay. I didn't rank. I didn't. I ranked ten forwards and eleven defensemen, uh, twenty-one skaters, no goalies. And that was the very first time all scouts asked them what they thought and then took that information and compiled it into a list that ranked them. But as I say, it was a forerunner of what I do now and what I've done for a long time. But the weird thing is I looked at it because it was actually Steve Dryden, the TSN quiz master, who asked me to check. He wanted to check and see if this year might be the 40th anniversary of the first time we did mm. Um we did uh, any rankings. And so, as I said, I went back in the bound copies of the, the hockey news that I've got and I looked and sure enough, there it was 1984. So then I went to the 1985 and I didn't do it. I, we just published the central scouting rankings and I looked in 86 and we didn't do it. And I, again, central scouting rankings in 1987, I looked and we didn't do it. And it wasn't until the, the, the 1988 year that we did a standalone draft publication and that one we ranked all the prospects okay 
and uh, on a composite list, you know, forwards, defensemen, goalies, all on one list, did the profiles, and that was, and we did that every year from then, and that gotcha. was the, the real genesis of, of what I've been doing ever since. Hmm. Well, put that back up for a sec there. I hate to correct you there, Bob, but um, Kirk Muller was uh, drafted in 84. That's correct. Yeah. That was a review. Right, um, right. Preview. But that was the first yeah. one where you really, like, I mean, it wasn't the, the full draft yeah. guide or whatever. No, but to this, this, what you're looking at there, if you look at the, if you look at the date. Oh, okay. That's June, 88. Okay. It's right, June of right. 88. The right. Gotcha. I don't even know why we put Muller on. We should have put Mario on. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask I'm, you about that. I'm not, yeah, I'm not right. sure what led to that shitty decision, but nevertheless, um, here we are. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. 88 was the first year that we did a standalone publication. Gotcha. A big, like, you know, 20, 30, 40 ranked players um, from based right. on the consensus of talking to the scouts. But, but yeah, that's right. Now, I mean, that uh, that draft guide, I mean, I must have read it a hundred times. I just <laughs> loved it. You know, it was such a, who whose idea was it? Was it your idea? To... That was my, it was my idea. And it was the bane of my existence because you know <laughs> how much time it takes to, you know, go from scratch, not knowing anything. See, it's different now too, because think about this. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Hockey News. So I'm covering all the teams in the National Hockey League. I've got a staff of, you know, started out as three or four, ended up being nine, 10, 11. There were multiple publications. We had a magazine, Inside Hockey. I, I had, you know, yeah. technical responsibilities, production responsibilities, computer systems to worry about this and, and that. So it was this unbelievable amount of stuff that you have to do just to get the publication out every week. And then you take it on to be, quote unquote, a draft expert which has always been a bit of a joke because I don't scout the players myself, never did, never will. Um, I see them play anecdotally here and there, but my expertise comes from stealing other people's information and that is the scouts. And well, But you've got to have the relationship with the scouts to be able to get them to tell you that information and that's what I was good at. So yeah. I realized I could take that information and package it and put it in, get a consensus and provide a unique proprietary thing that was different than what anybody else was doing at the time. But then stupidly, and and I got you hooked into this when you did the, the hockey news draft preview for a little bit, writing those profiles. So yeah. if you're gonna if you're gonna rank 40 or 60 or 80 players and you gotta write 80 profiles, initially I started, they were like 400 words each, and it was ridiculous. And and I don't remember the year that um, I don't remember the year, you could have to look it up, but it would have been the Iraq War, the NHL All-Star Game would have been in Chicago because everybody remembers the anthem while the Iraq War was going on and how yeah. crazy it was mm. and that. But I could, I was scheduled to go to that All-Star Game and I couldn't go because I, I literally was up for the better part of three days without sleep doing all the writing of the profiling and everything <laughs> and, I, and I had this deadline that I had to get to. And uh, so, yeah, that was that was somewhat insane, but uh, it is so, what it is. So you know how to uh, cut and paste, just like uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you see, cut and paste now. Cut and paste now is a different meaning. Cut and paste before you actually cut and paste. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My first job was a sports editor of the Chesterville Record. My first journalism <laughs> job, and you know, you're in there putting it together, right? You're uh, yeah. little one lines and you're moving them all around and cutting them, pasting. And yeah. you, you were, you were hands on right from day one then with the For hockey sure. news. Yeah. Well, mm. I, and I mean, uh, when I, when I, you know, started up recruits and uh, I, I followed your model. Like uh, I was fortunate enough to, um, while being related to Brian Murray and then Timmy Murray and Todd Hardy and, and that you know the guy from Shawville and getting to know them and, and getting to know Trevor Timmons and and doing a little scouting and stuff. I I always loved that you. I mean, who better to ask about the draft than the scouts, right? Yeah, and uh, I mean, how did you? How were you able to develop that trust with them where you wouldn't uh, share that information? And how did you know that mustn't have been easy? 
to do? Well, you know what? I just, again, every, everything kind of happens organically because I just got to know them and you become friends with them and yeah. you're around them a lot in junior rinks and what have you. And um, as I said, I had a, I had a great interest in it. You know, when I was, when I was at the Sioux star back in the day, the, the big thing used to be for the draft, the, was trying to get the NHL used to keep the central scouting list confidential. It was really mm. confidential. Nobody was to get it. Okay. Uh, and there were two guys, two junior hockey reporters that were really good at getting the, uh, <laughs> the central scouting, John Herbert from the London free press and Mark LaChapelle from the journal de Montreal. Okay. And they were the, they were the two guys that used to get, and I used to be like, when I was at the shoe star, I was like, I'm going to, this is the year I'm going to beat Herbie and Mark LaChapelle and I'm going to get it. Or, and I, I remember how proud I was one time when I got the NHL central scouting list. And, and then when I got to the hockey news, we would do the same thing. And we would always try to get the, the central scouting list. And, hmm. and uh, the stupid thing was the, the NHL back then didn't want it out there. It was the secret information, top secret. Um, instead of promoting their game by saying right. hey, the prospects coming up, get to know these guys. They're like, no, no, no. We don't want anyone to know anything about this. And so they even started going to great lengths because guys like John Herbert, Mark LaChapelle, and myself were putting the central scouting list, publishing it. They would start doing coded lists. So if they had back in the 21 era, 21 team era, they wow. would say, okay, on, on, on the, on the Hartford Whalers, the, the list we send out to the Hartford Whalers, let's switch 16 and 17. And on the list we send to this team, let's switch 19 and 22 or 21. And, and, and so every team got a little slightly different version, which makes no sense, but nevertheless, that's what they used to do. And then we had to start taking the list and to cover ourselves, we had to switch something up. So then they would, we would say, we switched up. So try and figure out where it's from. And it was chaos. So. That's crazy. I didn't realize Jeez. that. Was it Dorian, uh, Pierre Dorian, that started the Central Scouting? Or I'm trying to think who. I don't remember. I know he was at Central Scouting, but I also know he scouted for the Leafs. And that for the, for our viewers and listeners, that's Pierre Dorian Sr. Yes. Pierre Dorian, ex PM right. of the Senators, his dad. Mm. And uh, Pierre, uh, Pierre Sr. Was a, was a great guy and a snappy dresser. He used to wear. Used to wear. I always remember the, the suit he used to wear at the draft. Uh, the, the Arizona Coyotes brought those blue suits that one year. Yeah. You know yeah. the really electric blues, like much like the sweater <laughs> I'm wearing. Um, and that Pierre Dorian, when he was with the Leafs, he used to have a, a a real bright, bright, bright blue sweater, and he had white shoes and a white belt. And, <laughs> and he was always like, he was always a tan guy, and he looked pretty good. Pretty looked, yeah. Pierre looked pretty spiffy. Well, hopefully, uh, Rolf didn't show up at any of those drafts, or he might have lost a suit to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> as well. Um, now, uh, well, I think that's you know so much for the brief look down memory lane. That was, uh, <laughs> uh, but I mean that's great, Bob. I, I appreciate yeah. that. But I guess we're going to be uh, having you on a little longer than you know. I hope that's you, all right. Fire hope away. you're not in a rush here. But uh, let's get to the let's get to your draft list. That, that was the, mm -hmm. the purpose of bringing you on in the first place. So uh, we're uh, I'm going to put up my top 40 beside your top 40 here. And just to, I mean, it's pretty similar. You know? And it often yeah. is, right? Usually our lists are uh, fairly close at the top. Um, yeah. Now, uh, Caden Lindstrom, he, uh, I mean, I've loved him since the Halenka and as far as I'm concerned, the top five guys uh, after Celebrini, you can kind of interchange them. Yeah. I'm just curious to know if, uh, you know, if those guys, the top five were kind of close on your uh, on your list. I mean, I obviously I have Eisenman down a little bit, and I think yep. on some list he's kind of dropped a bit. Well, no, absolutely. Yeah, he's trending in the wrong direction. There's no doubt about mm. that. Um, okay. But, yeah, you know, we, and, and, and I think too, you know, you look at it and um, you, you might be less inclined to change your list as you go along because we, I think when, when you see a guy like Lindstrom, Lindstrom, who's, you know, six foot three center and he's filling the net and he's, you know, 
I mean, at the end of the day, you, you got to know that a six foot three center that's shooting the lights out and plays a <laughs> physical game, and you know that that that's what every NHL team in the world desperately wants. Oh yeah, yeah. Big big power center that, that's productive, and uh, so so yeah, you know. And again, mine's a consensus. So we had some people that had Lindstrom higher than I have him at five, and we have some people that have him lower. Um, yeah. And that when, when you do your list, you're looking at it and saying, okay, Celebrini's the number one guy, but I, I look and see a six foot three center that scored 37 goals in 42 games. Um, <laughs> duh, he's, uh, he's going to be one of the top handful of guys. There's no doubt yeah. about it. And same well, thing with uh, Siliev. He's, you know, a six foot seven defenseman, you know, the only proviso, and we can go round and round the Mulberry Bush on Russians, but, um, you know. Yeah. With video only scouting and no general managers or North American scouts getting to see this guy live, you know, it doesn't prevent you from taking him at a really high spot. But boy, you know, it, it adds an extra layer of uncertainty for the teams when they're contemplating that. And, uh, you know, I, one of the 10 scouts I, I, I uh, interviewed for our survey, you know, he said, I'll put I'll put Celebrini at one, but honestly, for us, hockey wise, just purely on hockey, you know, it's a it's a toss up. It's a jump ball between Siliev and uh, and Celebrini. Wow. And, 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 and so I'm like, okay, fair enough. And and I said, but you know, it's one thing to rank somebody equally. It's another thing at the moment of truth if you were picking in that Drop spot. Them. Would would you yeah. Would be still 50 50 at that moment when you have to make a decision and of course the answer is no because <laughs> yeah. there's not as much not as much comfort but you know a scout's job technically is is not to make the decision on whether you draft somebody or not the scout's job is to say this is the order i see them in this is yeah. how i put them and it's up to the manager to to decide what the final call is going to be and as another NHL scout said to me, um, I saw, yeah, another NHL scout said, um, I'd like to meet an NHL general manager who would take Siliev ahead of Celebrini, mm. not being able to go and see Siliev live yes. and not have your scouts there week after week after week, month after month after month, seeing live viewings with the people you trust the most, not just those scouts that are based in Russia. And, yep. and so who knows, maybe if, maybe if it were an open situation in Russia where the general managers and all the head scouts could go over to Russia and spend a really a, a significant amount of time watching Siliev practice, watching him game in, game out, maybe it is a jump ball for him and Celebrini because six foot seven defenseman that can skate the way he skates and can oh. do some of the things he does with the puck and do some of the things without the puck, as I say. Um, what do the NHL teams want more than anything else? They want big number one centers and they want big number one defensemen. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and well, Celebrini's, Celebrini's going to, by the way, if anybody says, well, Celebrini's not that big. Well, he's six foot, 190 pounds. And so you're right. He's not six foot three or six foot four. But I was looking at uh, Jonathan Taves' central scouting statistics bio yeah. for his draft here and he was he was like six one one ninety five so at the, at the same go. age taves was an inch taller and five pounds heavier than celebrini so uh, celebrini could still be you know a bigger guy and and he's got a, a power element to his game too mm -hmm. well i mean he's not Sidney crosby obviously but as far as away from the puck defensive zone and at that age I don't know that there's been a player that that scouts see that's just that defensively responsible as a center. Well, you know, yeah. and it's funny because some people hate when we use comparables, or even if you just mention, even if yeah. you qualify it. So I I will sit here and say to you, Macklin Celebrini is not Sidney Crosby, right? But but. <laughs> There are so many elements of his game that are so very, very similar to Crosby. Yes. Everything, just his, he's, he's always got the puck. When he's got the puck, he's a dangerous 
to make a play with it as he is to score a goal. His skills are outstanding. His tenacity and, and his, his industriousness, um, his work ethic, um, his character, um, without the puck, yep. the conscientious, you know, being conscientious without the puck, wanting to play defensively, track back and and be a, and, and do all the things that Sid was doing even when he was 16 and 17 years old. They have very similar games. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, I, and I'm always curious. So the first time I saw Celebrini play live in person was just this in December. I went to Oakville to the World Junior Camp. And um, so I was really looking forward to see him. And, you know, I'd seen him under, on, under 18s and saw how impressive he was. And I'd seen some, some games that he's played on TV, but I'd never seen him in, in person. So when I went there, and they were playing the U sports teams. You understand the U sports guys are all 20 to 25 years old. A lot of physically mature men that are good skaters and physically strong. And I watched the first 15 minutes, first 20 minutes. The, the first 20 minutes, it wasn't even close. There was only one player on the World Junior, the, the Team Canada roster that even looked like he could play with the, the university guys. He stood out, it was Celebrini, he had the puck. Mm -hmm. Every shift he was out there, he was making things happen. He was exciting. As soon as he came on the ice, you were like, oh, I got to watch what he's going to do. So, and, and I was curious and, and I, I thought about the Sydney comparisons in terms of approach and style of play. Um, I don't think he's as powerful or maybe quite as dynamic as Sid, right. but he might not be that far off. You never know. Yeah. Um, but the other one that, that I, I'd heard some people say, they remind he reminded them of Jonathan Taves. Yes. And so I thought back to the first time I saw Jonathan Taves live, which would have been in the Vancouver, uh, would have been 06, I guess, World Juniors, the camp yeah. in, in Vancouver. And um, I think that was his draft year. And um, I hadn't seen Taves play live. And I watched him and I was immediately drawn to how hard he worked, how good he was without the puck. Um, when he had the puck, how he's able to make plays and use his body to protect the puck. And, and, uh, and, and so I was watching Celebrini and I thought, I can see where a lot of people would say there are a lot of similar qualities to Jonathan Taves, another yeah. player who's real good without the puck and who is really good with the puck. And, and Celebrini's actually more dynamic offensively at the same age than Jonathan Taves was. And that's right. saying something because Taves was not without, you know, you know, skill and, and that sort of thing. But those are those are two guys whose names came up to me yeah. when I saw Celebrini. Mm -hmm. Now, so, okay. if if okay. I can cut in, Grant, sorry. While we're speaking on Celebrini, I'd just like to hear your opinion now. Where would you prefer him to go? Since the lottery hasn't been done yet, we don't know which team's picking first. Basing off of growth opportunities um the environment the fan base all, all all those factors combined is there a team that you're like okay this would be like a perfect situation for him well if you're an agent of chaos you'd say you hope the chicago blackhawks win the draft <laughs> oh, just to see oh, the reaction is going to be <laughs> Oh Oof. my goodness! Could you imagine if they? Yeah, if they I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to imagine if the, the Blackhawks end up with Macklin Celebrini and Connor Bedard. Oh, um, uh, but you know, I mean, you know, the the place that wants probably needs them should have them in the San Jose Sharks, and there's an obvious natural connection there because yeah, you know Macklin's dad, Rick, is the uh, director of you know, the performance and. Um, development and medicine and, okay. and with, the gold, with the Golden State Warriors of the NBA. And of course, Golden State is, wow. is uh, in San Fran and there's San Jose not too far. And and so, you know, when, you know, Maxwell Celebrini is probably the only prospect who at his USHL games had Draymond Green and other guys from the, the Warriors come out to, to see him play. <laughs> um, and, and, and so that's a, you know, kind of a natural fit. San Jose is so bad, right? Yeah, yeah. so bad. Oh. They're just a bad hockey team. And so could they use this? Now, you know, the other thing, and I mentioned it in, in, in the story that I did, I'll be curious to see whether Celebrini is uh, going to play in the National Hockey League next year or whether he decides mm. to do what Owen Power did, do what Eric Johnson did, do what Jonathan Taves did, and that is go back to school for a year. And, 
and uh, be that much more. You know, and, and here's the thing. When you've got a dad like Rick Celebrini, who's worked for the Vancouver Canucks in sports medicine, and he's, he's um, one of the pioneers in all sorts of medical things related to physiotherapy and uh, soft tissue and chiropractic work and uh, um, all of that, you know, and, and to, for him to be around Steph Curry and, and everybody connected with the Warriors and see their, their sports science and their development in sports medicine and everything that goes with it, who better to call the shot on his, uh, <laughs> than his dad in terms of what's best for his development. This yeah. is a case where it's not going to be, there's no National Hockey League general manager who's going to go tell Rick Celebrini, this is what we think is best, or we think we know better than you do what's best, yeah. because this guy's thought it all out. And part of the reason this kid's as good as he is, quite aside from all the God-given talent he's got, is the fact that he's he's had, you know, an elite level trainer his whole yeah. life. Yeah. Preparing him for every situation, both on and off the ice. That's it. Well, it'd be interesting, like Lane Hudson's brother, Cole, obviously he's gonna, you know, he's gonna play in BU next year. Now, you know, it, maybe that'll be a bit of a factor too. If, if Macklin says, you know, I'm gonna come back for another year. Uh, how about you come, you know, come back, uh, mentor your younger brother, and we'll go for a national championship. <laughs> like it, you know, it might have, yeah, it might knows. have a factor in it too. You never know. But uh, Macklin Celebrini is going to do whatever is best for his life. Oh, for sure. And, and, but, uh, and yeah, absolutely. 100%. He's in his brother's there. Um, that's right. Macklin, Macklin's own brother, Aiden, is there. And, that's right. Um, you know, and uh, what Cole Eiserman's supposed to go there next year, isn't he? Yeah, that's right. So I mean, and, you know, Eiserman and, Eiserman and uh, Celebrini were teammates at Chaddix. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, if they come up just a little short this year, maybe you know. I know. I I know. I've you know. I've seen it with other guys that wanted to come back and win. You know. I mean, they're in college, right? Uh, yeah. Best time of their life was. Best memories of my life were college time. You know, and who who knows? Maybe that that that's a that would be cool if they are. If they all played together next year too, hmm. um, so Leif, uh I don't know if you've heard, you know, and I'm not one big on comparisons all the time either. But my first thought when I saw him was Victor Hedman. Hmm. Yeah, and and that's there's a lot of scouts mention Hedman in terms of if this guy hits, if he pops the way that the scouts think he's going to, that he could could be a guy that would be in the Victor Hedman universe in terms of the things that he brings to the game. Um, it's not to say he's exactly the same as Hedman, that he's going to be better than Hedman or worse than Hedman, just that he's got the same physical dimensions. He skates extremely well. He's got the ability to contribute offensively. He's got the ability to shut things down defensively. Um, and as one scout said to me, you know, he's, he's not as purely offensive as Chris Pronger was at the same age. He's not as purely as as, as terrifyingly intimidating, um, and and uh, <laughs> as, as Zdeno Chara was at the same right. age when he was in Prince George, beating people up and what have you. Um, but he's got enough elements of both of their games that if if all develops the way that you would want it develop, that he could come into the National Hockey League and have a similar impact that Victor Hedman had on the Tampa Bay Lightning. And that's why he's as prized as he is. Yeah. Hmm. And, and I mean, I waited back and forth for me at two and three, you know, you can change. I mean, I've had Soleil of uh, two for most of the year, but yeah. Lindstrom, you know, the, the, the six, three Canadian center that's filled in the net that can skate great, that has a physical edge. That's uh, you, you know, you're probably going to get in a year or two and, and, and develop it, you know, through the Canadian uh, system. Uh, there aren't many drafts where a, where a kid that fits that description doesn't go top two, are there? No, exactly. So, and then again, it, sometimes it will come down to team needs and things like that. Everybody says they take the best player available, but some in a year where you've got so many big defensemen, I mean, you know, the, the Leshenoff kid from Michigan State, oh. mm. you know, he's – He's projected by a lot of scouts to be a top pair guy. He's already 6'2", 6'2", plus, 200-plus pounds. And, 
you know, really strong skater, and he's putting up some really good numbers. He's the third youngest player in the NCAA, and he's already got seven goals and better than a point a game. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and I don't think anybody's projecting him to be, quote, unquote, an offensive defenseman. But, I mean, he's going to be a really strong two-way guy that is going to contribute yeah. at a, a significant offensive level, but he's also going to be physical and shut down plays and kill plays and uh, be a good defensive defenseman as well. So to have two defensemen like Siliev and Le- 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 Shunov in in the top five for a team, you know, because some teams are loaded with talent up front and some teams are loaded on the blue line. But uh, yeah. so there might be, a, you know, we've got some real interesting decisions to make if you're a team whether it's forward or defense yeah um the guy that's that's risen the most in the top 10 over the last month for me is Perek. uh i think a lot of scouts didn't have him in the top maybe even the top 15 because there there were concerns with his defense you know and but i've seen i've seen a uh a progression with that and uh, yeah. I mean, he's on pace for a hundred points as a, <laughs> you know, as a rookie defenseman. Yeah. I, a, not a rookie defenseman, but a draft eligible defenseman. And I was looking back at stats, and you have to go back. The only guy, the last guy to do it was uh, was the coach of the <laughs> Bruce Cassidy when he was yeah. with the sixty seven. So I mean, there you go. He, well, he's I got a. Just, go ahead. I, I was just checking, and and seven of the ten scouts I talked to ranked them number 11 or higher. Wow. So I, I realized as I, as soon as I started doing it, you, sometimes you, it's always kind of intriguing as you start getting the results back from guys and you, I immediately noticed that trend that Perek was going to be a top 10 guy on our list. Because I know a lot of the other independent services, a lot of them had them lower and were flagging, you know, defensive plays, a one trick pony, he's purely an offensive guy, but um, as they say about Iserman, if you're a one-trick pony, scoring goals is a pretty good trick to have. Yeah. And uh, and and I think too, there's a feeling that you know he's not he's not like he's not five foot nine, he's not five foot ten, he's six feet tall. Yeah. He's, he's he's not you know he's not a monster, and but he's he's a strong kid, and he's a great skater, and a great shooter, and a great with the puck, and. Um, you know, so, you know, and again, I'm not, and, and I'm definitely not comparing this kid to Eric Carlson, but part of the reason Carlson fell in, in his draft was because of size, because of the size, the defensive, you know, no tendencies for defense, all offense all the time. Um, and, you know, the well, more and more scouts I talk to are getting a sense that Zane Parekh is going to have a huge offensive impact in the National Hockey League. And there don't seem to be any physical flags in terms of why he couldn't learn to play defense. And that he doesn't, you know, he's not one of those kids that has an attitude of, I have no interest in playing defense. Mm. It's just, I'm better at offense in junior hockey than I am defensively. And his defense probably, as you point out, isn't as bad as people think it is anyways. Yeah, I saw him live last weekend and he, he was fine. Uh, defensively yeah. he competes like he's not I know yeah. early on and you probably heard it too was uh you know well he could be the next Ryan Merkley but um he seems to have a lot more interest in learning how to play defense right. uh, everyone that I talk to uh you know uh boasts about his character that he's a real character kid and a character family and stuff so I think he's just going to keep with his feet and uh you know, uh, and in competitiveness, that he's only just going to improve defensively as he goes along. Yeah, and you're, you're right. There was Ryan Merkley, and and you're right. At the time, even in his draft year, the, he was flagged for attitude or character or whatever you want to call it. it you, nobody was uh, disputing his offensive ability, but there were people that worried about you know uh, overall attitude. Um, and I remember Ryan Murphy, who played for the Kitchener Rangers. Um, he yeah. was an all offensive guy and there's some comparisons between Murphy and correct, but, um, there was also a sense that Murphy really didn't have great interest in wanting to learn how to play the defensive side. And I don't think anybody gets that vibe from correct. 
Um, Good. And, uh, and I think Preck might, and I could be wrong on this, but I think Preck might be a little bigger than, than Murphy was at the time. But yeah, yeah. The only guy in our top 16 where there's a little bit of a difference, I would say, uh, I've got a Ginla eighth, and I believe your list has him uh, 16, is it? Yeah. So... Uh, and, uh, and then Catton, I've got like 16, and you have 10. Now, um, yeah, were there any, uh, were there some guys that, that had Oginla as a top 10 guy? Because I know some scouts. Uh, That's that what I'm looking for to. right now. Let's have a peek here. Keep this very confidential, you know. <laughs> um, where is Oginla? I had a couple of guys that had them 10 or higher. Um, the vast okay. majority of them were then after that was like 11 to 20. Okay. So there were eight other guys that had them 11 to 20. And, um, well, and you know, but <laughs> this is the thing about consensus rankings is, you know, at the end of the day, it takes one team to like yeah. a guy or not like a guy. Yeah. And it throws the whole thing right out the window. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I'm never surprised when somebody who's ranked in the 15 or 16 or 17 or 18 goes in the top 10. And I'm never surprised when somebody who's ranked in the top 10 falls exactly. out and then goes down to 20 because in reverse, it's, you know, it only takes one team to like a guy for him to be selected up here. It only takes one team to not like a guy for him to drop to the next level. It only takes that team to like one guy better <laughs> than that guy. And the next team, only one team, you know, like yeah. one guy better than that guy and boom, boom, boom. And suddenly a guy mm -hmm. is falling down the charts and people are saying, why is he falling down the charts? There must be a reason. Well, it could be there. There's sometimes maybe there is something got flagged on a character issue or a physical issue or something, but quite often it's just the coincidence of five teams in a row liking one guy better than that one guy who got passed yep. over yep. once up here and suddenly now he's on the roller coaster ride down and everybody thinks that's interconnected when it's really, I just like this guy a little bit better than that guy. Yeah. We, we saw, sorry, we saw, we, it, we saw that exactly with Gabe Perot and with yeah. Dmitry Simashev, right? Bob, Bob, yeah. you had him 19th. He went sixth, you know, <laughs> and then, and then Perot, like your size. <laughs> went yeah. 23rd. So that's, you explained that perfectly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you yeah, know, exactly. uh, Arizona. And I don't, and you're right on the, on the pro thing. I don't think anybody is looking at it and saying, oh, pro is a terrible skater you know, or he's got a character issue. That, I don't think it was any of those things. I think it was in that instance, it was like, we just like one guy better than I Gabe Perot and it kept on happening. And yeah. It ends up being a coincidental thing. And I think anybody who looks at it now would say, that's a nice pick for the Rangers. <laughs> Well, he was a little smaller, right? And uh, there's yeah. always the size factor. And I think yeah. that's why. He, but there were teams, that, certainly scouts, that had him top eight, you know. Yeah. And uh, like everyone I knew liked him top 10. But it only mm -hmm. takes uh, one of, like one other guy. And I, I always say that. So let's yeah. uh, let's go on to the next uh, next 10. Now, uh we're uh our lists are very similar like there's not you know there's not a lot of difference there uh when you look at this group Connolly had such a great world junior challenge it uh mm. I, I could see him if, if teams end up being okay with with the character and the things i think you you could see him uh going top 10. could you not yeah, a number of scouts made the remark that you know if you just look at it on overall play um, Trevor Conley's out playing Cole Eiserman this season. Yes. Um, and, uh, and that, so that's to be looked at. I mean, um, Yakim Chuck's an interesting guy, a lot of goals for a big defenseman. Um, I, yeah. we, we ranked him, I ranked him at 12, you ranked him at 14. And I, I do know that, you know, uh, some of the scouts I talked to like him, you know, some, some actually had him in, inside the top five. So that's one where it's like the goals and the size can be a, a seductive wow. thing. So that's a guy that, you know, might go, could, if he went a lot higher than either you or I have him, 
And again, this is mid-season rankings. I always allow for the possibility oh, for sure. things are going to change drastically between now and the end of the season. So, yeah, and I, what like obviously you then had some guys that had them outside of the top fifteen. Uh, yep. it, it, th- what I've heard on it, it th- there are some teams that, that there's still uh, some concerns with the skating. I guess that's probably right. what you heard too, right? Yeah. Yep. So uh, it's, it's, it's you know again big defensemen scoring all those goals. Oh, and, uh, yeah. He's uh, he's um, I mean, what you got him six one and three quarters. I think it listed. So good size. Yeah. Uh, he's just always involved in the game, right? And um, right. Uh, I I think that he uh, he's one of those wild cards at this point. I could see him. That doesn't surprise me that some teams have him that high. But uh, it also doesn't surprise me from yep. th- there are some concerns with some with this skating and right. that that can always hurt a guy. Uh, going into the year, Kiva Haru was, uh, I mean, a lot of people consider him as a potential top five guy. Now, why do you think he's dropped off so much? Is it mainly because of his injury? Well, it's certainly the injury is a factor. And and. Again, I think the, the pendulum for the draft, for me, it always swings back and forth. Um, and there was a period of time where, um, you know, the, the, the smaller mobile puck handling defensemen, their, their stock was soaring through the roof. And then we've had a run of Stanley Cup champions. And when you look at their blue line, there's a lot of tall trees back there. Oh, a, lot yeah. of, a lot of length, a lot of weight, a lot of height. Um, a lot of six two, six three, six four, you know, Vegas and uh, and and the like, and um, and I think the pendulum's starting to swing back a little bit, and that's not to say that they won't make an exception at times for smaller defensemen, um, but you know if you yeah. go back and look at, and and you would be better at this than I would. I I need to get my old NHL guide and record book or get on the the Google machine and. <laughs> and go back and, and look at how many 5'9", 5'10", 5'11", mobile puck handling defensemen that were drafted in the first round never made it. Yes. Yeah. And there's a lot of them. Yes. And the ones that yeah. do, you know, so Samuel Gerard's great and, and what have you. And and in last year there was there seemed to be – there weren't a lot of defensemen available last year. Um, yeah. But a lot of the ones that were, were tended to be on the smaller side. Simashev accepted, um, yeah. you know, and so, you know, Detroit didn't hesitate to jump in on Axel Sandin Pelica, especially where they got him. Um, but, he, yeah. you know, he ended up going a little bit later than maybe some people thought he was going to go, and in part maybe because of size. This year, the defensemen that are available, you know, <laughs> six foot seven uh, for, for Siliev, you know, six two plus for... Uh, for Lev Shunov, um, the uh, the other one. Dickinson's a big kid too. Dickinson's a big kid. Um, yeah. yeah. My, my list here. Um, yeah, you know, Yakimchuk is six two. <coughs> Excuse me, Yurichek's not a small guy. No, no. You know, and and then then you get into Kivi Harju, and he's just you know obviously. People were very excited him at the beginning of the year, and the injury certainly doesn't help. And he yeah. might be a guy that would would override that size concern because he's so dynamic. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But now he's got no more games to be played this year, and that's not going to help him. Yeah. No, for sure. I, I mean, I have at least a dozen guys in the top thirty uh, defensemen. Uh, I, I think this is one of the strongest defense crops that i can remember it's deep do, yeah. do you uh are you getting yeah, that feeling it, it, there's a lot of defensemen and the, the, the scouts like and i was looking at it compared to last year we had we had two in the top whatever it was top 10 or eight or whatever mm-hmm. and then only four in the top 20. Um, yeah and this year on our rankings tsn rankings seven of the top 14 players are defensemen and yeah and all seven of them are six feet or more. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, so, and lots of right defensemen too. So it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's looking like a really strong defense. And I think Canada too, like in the last uh, five years or so, 
um, in the first round, there hasn't necessarily been that deep a, a group of Canadians, but it's looking like a pretty strong, especially in the WHL. It's a, it's a strong. Yeah, round. big big time. It was a big year in the dub last year, and it's another big year this year. So yeah, and I, yeah. I think of of our thirty top thirty two ranked guys on the TSN list, eighteen are Canadian. That's a high number, and and I mean, there's only one Swede, and you got yeah. Pedersen. Pedersen, you know just just made the cut on our list and he's kind of a wild card because there is support for him a lot higher than where we had him um oh really there's eh? also there's a lot of yeah and but there's also a lot of support for him way into the second round and, hmm. and late second and and that so he's a he's a little wild card and there's a bunch of wild cards there and and so let me ask you you saw ottawa valley guy Laterno, what's he all about yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna put up we're gonna put up the next uh, twenty here, and I've got him, Brayside, right from Brayside. I've got him twenty one. Yeah. There you go. And uh, oh, you got you uh, cut off. At yeah, but he's at thirty. He's at thirty two on ours. Which, so he just yeah. made the cut. Well, that's good. Yeah. I mean, he's six and, foot and, seven. And I and I got and I can tell you, I got three scouts that have him inside the top twenty, and I got. Okay. Three or three scouts that have them that barely had them in their top eighty. And, yeah, well. And then I got a bunch of guys in the second round. Some of them just outside the second round. So, I, I mean, he's big. He's skilled. He, you know, some scouts have to get over the the, the feeling of somebody who's six foot six. Um, uh, tough. He, he's got to be. He's got to be physical. He's got to be tough. He, he, you know you got to get over that and realize, okay, well, can he use his size to advantage? So the, you know, the question scouts will ask themselves is, is this guy a legit guy that can transpose his size, strength, athleticism, and skill and product productivity at the next level? Or is he Joe Coburn? You know, mm. yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. a guy who was, you know, six foot five or whatever, when he played, junior a in the alberta junior league and and played right. in the nhl but didn't really make a a significant mark for a prolonged period of time yeah i wasn't a big joel colbert guy i <laughs> i thought he was overrated but uh, uh that one i got right sometimes the blind squirrel gets it gets the nut right um <laughs> yeah. the but uh, and also the fact that, that he's playing at saint andrews college so that yeah. factors in with some scouts too i think right yeah, and the fact that he's, you know, whether he's in Sioux Falls next year, or I don't know when he plans on going to BC, Boston College, how soon that is. Does he play a year in the USHL and then go, or what's yes. uh, what the plan is? I'm not sure. So, yeah, what do you, what do you think of the just what I'm thinking of at the AHL, AJHL? Uh, um, yeah, you know uh, what? I haven't. I, I don't know enough about it. Okay, it's it's, it's very. When I say it's disconcerting, I, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, you know, it's it's disconcerting that there's as much upheaval um, in the junior yes. hockey system in Canada with kids getting caught in the middle and games being canceled and and how's it all going to work in the whole Outlaw League versus Hockey Canada and all the politics that get involved. So I don't know enough about it and I'm outside of that realm now that I don't have to take the time or effort to educate myself on it um so <laughs> yeah. um and that's why i i literally call myself the hockey outsider so i don't have an opinion <laughs> other than it's unfortunate that that um things are as fractured as they are and that it's not more of a cohesive with the development model you want you want stability not chaos and mm. this initial yes. thing maybe this leads to more stability in some fashion but in the short term, it's much more chaotic, and that makes it harder for everybody. Absolutely, I noticed um, Greed Greedens a bit of a, um, you, you know, he's. Uh, you probably have some guys that have him towards the end of the second round, or yep. I would think. Yeah, there's some some question, you know, would he play with enough pace? And then there's other guys that. Uh, that have them a lot higher than we have. Yeah, them yeah. So, no, I figured that that you it's must. A big, he's, have. A, he's a big range, and 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 quite frankly, um, 
you know, Breeden at 29. Um, uh, Pedersen at 31, Letourneau at 32, Polkinen at 33, Artemanov at 34, um, Sh uh, Shurvin at 39, Hudson at 40, um, Hughes at uh, uh, those, a couple of those numbers might have been off. That was an older list I was looking at, but there's there's a whole bunch of guys that are really all over the map. Mm, yeah, to kind of being wild cards and yeah. <laughs> excuse me, you know, a guy like Polkin, I'm not sure what to make of him. Well, I got Dude, him in the guy, first. You're you're older than than most of the prospects, and yeah. um, offensive ability and size and. Uh, It'll be fascinating to see what goes. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. I've come off a little bit of illness and I just ran out of water. So. No problem. The uh, Polkanen, the, I was uh, I was trying to think of the last uh, undrafted guy that was eligible in the year before. I think Tanner Pearson was the guy, last first round, mm. uh, first yeah. overage guy right. that was picked yeah. in the first round. Yeah, could well, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, and um, Luchenko, I'm going to uh, I'm going to presume that he's another guy that uh, some teams maybe had mid second or so. He's not the biggest kid, but boy, he's got really nice, uh, really nice mitts, eh? Yeah, he does, and um, yeah, I, you know, there's a lot of support for him in the 20s. There's a lot of support for him in the 30s. There's a lot of support for him in the 40s. Yeah. So, you know, is he a guy that could slip out of the first round? Yeah. Is he a guy who could go a little higher than that? Yeah. And Parasak, I think that's an odd, you know, as much as anything, like I don't see uh, physical skills that he's not the biggest guy. He's maybe not the greatest skater. Right. Uh, but you, you got to give uh, give him a nod for, for the points that he's put up this year and just really smart kid. Eh? I guess, again, they're, you know, in talking to some scouts that I know, they don't see him as a first rounder, but uh, right. based on merit, on um, what he's accomplished this year, he's got to be, uh, you know, in the 25 to 35 range with most, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, and I can find two or three scouts that have him a lot higher than that. Mm, yeah. Um, and then uh, more that have him right around there or in the 30s. And then, as you point out, down in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Yeah. Well, I mean, it make it, it it's always fascinating. So when you get those rankings and you know darn well that there's going to be, uh, you know, that there's going to be surprises from what, you, you know, you look at your list and you, and people will say, oh, well, that guy dropped so much, but you know, just from the, the surveying scouts that it could be, you know, the guy could go anywhere from where you have him to a round yeah. or two or more, right? Yeah, and as I say, these are just mid-season rankings, and uh, they <laughs> could be in quite a state of flux between now and the end of the year. I think. Yeah, no doubt. Mm -hmm. EJ Emery is another guy that I think you're going to see teams uh, maybe warm up to a bit, and um, another one of those big defensemen that can skate. And I've I've seen yep. the um, comparisons to Conde Miller more than once. Right. Yep, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Uh, let's bring up the last uh, last grouping here. Okay, there's a, there's the Brayside boy there, thirty two. Yep. And uh, Masse still in your top thirty five, eh? I know um, scouts have uh, 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 just cooled on him a little bit because of skating concerns, and I guess right. that. Uh, Again, you probably have guys that like him in the first, uh, the end of the first, and then there's probably guys that like him in the 50 range. Yeah, I would say um, there's a lot of strong support for him, 20s, 30s, and 40s. So, Good, good. Yeah, well, that's uh, – and Henry Muse is someone that, I mean, I get to see Ottawa quite often, and uh, – yeah. I think he's been he, he's sort of been trending down a bit uh, over the last couple of months. Yeah, there's uh, again. I'm not sure what's uh, what's the size on news. Well, that's that's uh, that's funny. They've got him listed at six foot, but six foot one eighty three. 
I, I certainly don't. If he's six foot, it's, uh, you know, it's maybe with his running shoes on, put it that way. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, that's, again, our, our top 40 is pretty close. And it's, uh, um, like you say, there's not a lot of Swedes. I've got the one Swedish defenseman, Wallenius, in the, in the first. And you've got him at 38 Same there. Side, so that's... Yeah. You know, yeah. that, and, that's and and I should point out that literally, uh, I would say maybe not every player, but but and this is usually true of the, the rankings year after year after year. Is usually anybody who's ranked in the top 50 to 55 on the TSN list usually ends up with at least one, if not two, um, first round votes. It's not unusual. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's why it's always nice to get as many guys drafted. And if you've got 32 ranked in the first round, you're always hoping that 32 go in the first round, but they don't. And that somebody who's ranked 50 some odd usually ends up in the first round. And that doesn't surprise me in the least because when you talk to the scouts, as I say, it only takes one team to like exactly. a guy and boom, done. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, a uh, solid, uh, and the midterm rankings, as you know, uh, things will change, and sometimes quite a bit. The one guy, uh, like you have Berkeley Catton at 10, for instance, yep. now. Uh, I'm reminded a bit of uh, Braden Yeager last year, who right up until probably February was in the top 10. He had had such a great right. Lika. And you, you never forgot that, right? But then mm -hmm. the more you watched him and the more you looked at a a, a 5'11 centerman, you want to, to go to the dirty areas uh, to compete because it's going to be so hard to be a top two center at that size in the NHL unless you, right. you, you are really competitive. And I think uh, Jaeger, by the end of, you know, he ended up going, I think, after 15 last year. Right. And I, I could see a similar thing happening with Catton. It, even though we, we've seen how skilled he is and he, he puts up good point totals. Uh, what what has uh, your feedback been on Catton this year? Well, I guess we're really, quite aside from Catton, just in general terms, Yeah, that whole sliding value of, say, a center. So if you're picking in the top 10, you, you you know the, there seems to be a sense internally with the team you want to hit a home run you want somebody mm -hmm. who's going to be a top line guy if he's not a top line guy somebody who's going to really be a top two line guy and to your point if you think if you think that you know using the Jaeger example from last year that he's more likely to be a three than a two well then you know you're be more comfortable taking a three, a potential three, three C at 15 or later, as opposed to 10 or higher. And, and that's what happens with a lot of these guys. Um, and again, it's all subjective. I mean, it all yeah. comes out in the wash three to five years from now. Yeah. Um, and, and what have you, but that internally teams have this perception of what is the ceiling for this guy. And it's a, you know, there's what they, the old safe pick. Uh, I think if you're picking in the top 15, you generally don't want a safe pick. You'd like to get a player that you believe is going to impact you in a big way. And and, and that e equates to, is the guy a top two line player or a top four defenseman? And, and those are the guys, that's how decisions get made internally with the teams. And they're saying, yeah, we think this guy's going to be a top two line player, but we... We, therefore, we don't hesitate to use a top 10 or a top 12 or a top 15 pick on him. Um, and that, so the, the thing with Catton, I mean, he, he, he was best player for Canada at the World Junior, uh, sorry, at the uh, Holenka last summer. Oh, yeah. He had all those goals. He played extremely well. He's not the fastest skater in the world. He's not the biggest guy in the world. Um, but, you know, he's, he's a really smart player and uh, yeah. he plays a real good two-way game and... Uh, and, and has offensive capabilities. So teams will vary on teams will, you know, some teams will look at him and say, as you did, maybe he's going to be a three. If he's going to be a three, 
and we're picking in the top 12 or 13, maybe let's try and go for somebody that's going to be a two or take a top four defenseman. Um, and that, yeah. whereas some other teams might look at Catton and say, we're picking in the top 10 and we're confident this guy's going to be a, a second line center in the National Hockey League and he's going to be responsible without the puck and he's going to be, uh, you know, he, he can make plays and he can score goals and he's going to contribute enough offensively to be a 2C. Let's take yeah. And uh, it, a, a lot will depend on playoffs. It always does for me and I think it does yep. for NHL teams. If he if he produces like he is now at playoff time when things get tighter, uh, he'll go back up my list. He might be top 10, you know. Uh, yeah. And I think that that's, that's an important factor for uh, NHL teams as well. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, okay, Bob. Uh, 90 minutes, I think uh, that's enough of your time. <laughs> uh, and Yellow's going to be, uh, he's going to be pulling his one hair out there, uh, seeing how long this podcast went. But, uh, <laughs> um, you, you, so, such a pleasure to have you on, Bob, and thanks for taking so much time. Really appreciate it. I appreciate it. it. Thanks for having me, guys. It was my, my pleasure. I don't really do podcasts anymore, but no. I wanted to promote the, uh, wanted to make sure I did my due diligence to promote the TSN midseason draft rankings and also uh, uh, to have a chance to talk to you, Brent. Okay, awesome. Bob. Thanks and a lot. And try not to fight with so many people on social media. Yeah. It's, not, well, it's, not, it's not very becoming. No, I, uh, you know, I'm not as cantankerous as I used to be. I, I, think you, <laughs> I hit the big 6-0 there this past weekend, so Life's I'm, I'm short, mellowing, I'm mellowing yeah, with age. Too short to, yeah. Take care of Teddy and away you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. All right, Bob. Take care. Thank awesome, you so guys. much. Thanks a lot. Take All right, bye-bye. That was Bob McKenzie, the legend, the draft guru who doesn't scout. But you know what? He is the reference. Every year he gets it right. So uh, you know what? When he puts out his last ranking, you can put some money on it. It's probably going to be pretty accurate. And um, man, that was so much fun. It, you know, an hour and a half, maybe it's it's our longest show yet, but it could have been so much longer. I mean, there's there's just so much to delve into. So we, we really appreciate Bob's time. Uh, Grant. Uh, any any parting remarks? Uh no, that was uh, that was just uh, marvelous. And uh, Bob's, uh, you know, Bob's my uh, mentor mm -hmm. when it comes to anything. Uh, I got into this business and draft guide and all that. Uh, I have to say, largely because of Bob. So it's just uh, I got to know him when he, um, like he he mentioned there. I, I got in touch with him when he was doing TSN's draft profiles and struck up a, a friendship and he got me to write profiles for TSN for a couple of years till the, they hired Craig Button to do all that stuff. And uh, um, he, he's just a, a super, super nice guy that uh, I completely respect. So yep. uh, thanks again to Bob for uh, coming on with us. Yeah, I know. I know uh, everybody's gonna, tuning in is going to be loving this, um, you know, and, and, Hey, who knows? Hopefully, we can we can get him on again. Uh, that would be that would be great. Closer to the draft, get those get those final rankings and all that. But uh, in the meantime, you know what? We're, we're we're keeping rolling on, right? We've been on a roll lately. Uh, we're gonna get some more great guests for you. And and as always, we're gonna have our our uh, prospect show with uh, our friend Rocco every week. Uh, it's not changing anytime soon. So uh, we we thank you all for tuning in. Much appreciated, and we'll see you all in the next one. Take care. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Sick Podcast Recruits Draftcast on YouTube, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.